All right, well, hello and welcome. How are you today, Cabbage? I'm doing pretty good. How about you, Hoopla? I, I am doing wonderful. Um, I have gone down kind of the black hole of trying to figure out how to do these streams and make it better and better every day. So we hopefully have an audio fix for um, when we do our Zoom interview in a little bit. Um, awesome. But uh, yeah, it's been a busy day at camp. How about you? Doing pretty good. I was a little confused earlier. You were talking to me about how the video was set up, going from this computer to that computer and back and forth. And I just kind of nodded and smiled and uh, plugged in what you told me to plug in. Yeah, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I don't know why, studio mode. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. So um, I guess they couldn't see us for that beginning part, so we're still obviously <laughs> uh, working out the kinks. But um, yeah, so uh, today we've got a really great show. Um, we got such great feedback from, um, the, the, I think it was our second episode where we had an opportunity um, to, or was it our, anyway, where we introduced um, our, our bearded dragon and our new bunny. Um, we uh, really wanted to, to expand on that and give you guys a chance to meet some of our new Nature Center animals. Um, so uh, today we'll be meeting Herman the Snake, uh, as well as uh, my good friend Who, um, who uh, is actually a, a pretty avid fish collector from, uh, from my understanding. To specify, Who is not a fish, he is a camp counselor. Yes. Not an animal. He well, yeah. like a technically, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's a great guy, and uh, and we really really enjoy having him around. Um, so we'll be talking to him uh, in just a few minutes. Um, so uh, just one comment before we really get going into the into the rest of the stream and into the rest rest of the webcast. Um, we uh, really need your guests and need our campers' help. So if if you know someone um, that has a really cool hobby or a really cool job uh, that would feel comfortable either jumping on a Zoom call with us and, and doing kind of a tour like we've done over the last couple days. Or uh, if you if, if you yourself have one of those uh, hobbies or interests, um, please comment on the stream or send us a message on Facebook, and we'll be happy to uh, to, to to bring you on the show. Um, so yeah. So without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and introduce our good friend um, Hank Moss or Who. Um, so we'll go ahead and switch on over and uh, let's see. Uh, who can you hear us? Okay. Oh yeah. Yes. How's it going, Who? Good. How are you? Doing good. Very nice, very nice. So, um, so who are you in your apartment in Raleigh, or are you uh, back home with uh, at, at base camp with mom and dad? I'm I'm still in my apartment at Raleigh. Very nice, very nice. So, um, are, are you still taking classes online? I assume. Yes. So um, tomorrow actually is my last final exam, and then I'm done. Nice, nice. And what's your what's your major at NC State? I'm majoring in Parks and Recreation with a concentration in program management. Very cool. And, and what do you want to do with that, that degree someday? Uh, hopefully, I want to end up with a job like one of you two at right. some camp somewhere. Cool. All right, yeah. we need to be careful. He might be, on the, <laughs> might be on the hunt for one of our jobs here in the next couple of, uh, in the next couple of years. So very, very cool. <laughs> Um, well, who um, today, you know, we were really excited because who is known as one of our most uh, energetic and just really fun and boisterous camp counselors. Um, so um, we're really excited to have him here and on today because I'm sure he'll be uh, have some great entertainment. So who can you just tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, your first of all, your camp name, uh, who you are and, and kind of why you why you love working at summer camp? Yeah, so um so my name, my camp name is Pooh, and that's based off of, uh, I've got a small little nose, and it makes me kind of look like the Who's on the Grinch, so that's <laughs> kind of where I got my name from, and also I thought it would be cool to have a confusing name at first, but it's gotten kind of weird since then, but I, I enjoy it, that's why most people call me Hootie now, and um, so yeah, I, I started coming to Camp Weaver when I was a rising fourth grader I believe because I I had Ozzy's wife as my third grade teacher and um, I learned about the camp obviously through her and I started coming that following summer and I've been coming ever since so this coming summer will be about my 13th or 14th year one of those two and it'll be my fifth summer on staff so yeah awesome and I I enjoy I enjoy being a counselor there because you know like looking back on my camping years, I I remember my counselors more than I remember my fellow campers, and I and I looked up to them so much. I want to have that same impact on the campers today. Awesome, so, yeah. Um, 
while you've been at camp, um, let's say as a as a camper, what was your favorite camp activity? And then now as a counselor, what's your favorite camp activity and are they different? Let's see. I think I think as a counselor, uh well, as a camper, my favorite activities were sports and ropes. Those were like what I gravitated to a lot because mm -hmm. I really loved playing sports and I loved the danger aspect of ropes and all that kind of stuff. Um, as a counselor, though, I think I've had a, a more growing uh, appreciation for the lake and the pool and how much fun you can have there, especially when I was a day camp counselor and you go swimming every morning. Uh, like. I really never went to the pool as a camper, but as a counselor, I realized that I regret not doing it as much. I, I really had a lot of fun at the pool as a, as a counselor. Awesome. Um, so who, what is, uh, what is your, what's your favorite memory of camp? And this could be um, your time as a camper, um, or it could be uh, your time as, as, a, as a camp counselor as well. Um, I would say, Hmm, that's a tough question. Uh, I would say my favorite memory of camp was my third week of my CIT session, which was also Camp Corral. When the when the CITs get to uh, experience being in a cabin with campers and learning from the counselors and that, I just had such an awesome experience that week and really bonded with everyone in the cabin, the campers as well as the counselors that were mentoring me. And it was just an awesome week. That's awesome. Uh, for those of you that don't know, who just mentioned Camp Corral, which is one of our partners, um, and they sponsor a week of summer camp during the summer that is entirely for uh, children of um, people who have seen service and uh, a lot of people who have seen um, uh, damage through service or have had a personal injury. Hey, who? We had an awesome um, question um, from. Actually, she's become one of our regular viewers. Um, it's uh, it's Breland's mom, actually from Camp Corral, and she said that her daughter really wants to go to NC State um, when she when she gets older. Um, can you tell us how the food is on campus? And do you have oh, any tips? <laughs> yeah, the NC State food on campus is awesome. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are iffy about the dining halls, but I really like them because of the diversity of the food that they serve. It's pretty much like each night, some nights will have a theme and they'll serve something different and you can just go every day and like have a balanced meal every day and not eat the same thing. So I like that aspect. And also, you know, there's at the um, student union, there's also restaurants. There's, there's a, a place called Los Lobos, which I really love. It's kind of like Chipotle and Moe's. It's, it's probably my favorite place to go to. And there's also a Jason's Deli. Very nice. Now, is there, when I went to school, I went to school at Missouri State University in Springfield, and uh, the trick was, is you always went to Garst Dining Hall, not to Blair Shannon, because Garst was always less popular. Are there any, like, s sneaky tips that uh, you, you can give future NC State students for the best place to go? Um, uh, there's, the, the two dining halls are, there. well, there's Fountain Dining Hall, and then... I, I honestly can't even remember the name of the other one because it's so much less popular. But it's it's like on the um, <laughs> it's like closer to the. I, I lived on the. They're basically on opposite sides of the campus, so it's pretty much where your dorm room is, is where you, which one you go to. But they're I think they both pretty much serve the about the same food. Very nice. Well, that that, that was a great question. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Breland's mom or, or Carrie for asking. Um, that's exactly why we like to do these Facebook Lives. Um, so I guess uh, for our next kind of little segment as we talk to you, um, we'd love to, to learn a little bit about the, the fish collection. Um, that was something new I did not know about you. Uh, yeah, I didn't until... know who uh, collected fish either. Um, who I've been uh, wondering, I grew up at the beach, and I was wondering, do you have saltwater or freshwater fish? So my fish are actually freshwater fish. I'm working okay. out my tank now. Um, so I'll flip the camera around. This is one of my tanks right here. This tank is five gallons. It's got four beta fish in there. And as you've probably heard before, a lot of people say like, you can only keep one beta fish at a time. But with the females, actually, if you have at least four of them, they create a school and they live just fine together. Oh, yeah, that's nice. my beta fish tank. So are all, all four of those in that tank are all females? 
Yes, they're all females. Cool. Um, what is the little thing that's down in the bottom corner? It, it looks like a oh, magnet? This is a magnet to clean the tank. You just brush it over and it cleans the algae off the side of the glass. Nice, nice. And then, uh, so what about, uh, what about your other tank? Can you, uh, can you show us your yeah, This is tank? my 10 gallon tank. That it's only got that one fish in there. I kind of am planning on getting a couple more, maybe a little school of, of fish, but that's called a Bolivian ram cichlid. And um, cichlids are either from South America or from a Africa. This specific one is from South America. And they're honestly kind of like little three inch long bass, like with their aggression and their predator instincts and stuff like that. They'll eat just about anything you throw in there. This is what I feed them. Right there. Yeah. Sinking carnival. <laughs> Very cool. So um, does he, is he a pretty solitary fish or because of his aggressive nature, is it tough to find other fish that he can, uh, that he can be with? So, yeah, so you either keep them solitary or in breeding pairs. So I just chose to keep just him because of the size of my tank. Yeah, awesome. So um, can you just um, use just any old water? Um, do you just go to your sink and fill it out? What do you have to do to, 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 to get the water ready for your fish to live in? So there's a lot of aspects to go through or to choose from in that. Um, me personally, I'd buy spring water in gallons from the uh, grocery store because it doesn't have the chlorine that's in most tap water. And, but if you do use tap water, you have to buy something that's usually sold in PetSmart that takes the chlorine out of the water. You just squirt it in the tank and it takes the chlorine out of the water. But with the spring water, you just pour that in there. And then uh, they also sell this right here. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. This is a product that adds bacteria to the water, which um, helps like get the ammonia and stuff out of the tank from the fish's feces. <laughs> Good oh, cool. stuff for the fish poo. Uh, well, thanks for sharing. Um, thanks for sharing the, 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 your, your fish collection with us and kind of showing us around. Um, do you have any kind of final thoughts um, that, that uh, you'd like to share with our camper families, your fellow staff, um, and uh, just any well wishes you'd like or shout outs that you'd like to make? Um, I mean, I'll just shout out all the new staff that are coming to camp this summer. I'm excited to meet everybody. It's going to be an awesome summer. And uh, as far as everything that's going on in the world, just I encourage everyone to stay positive. Uh, stay active is a big thing. Don't want to, you know, ruin your physical or mental health through all this. So, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right, who? Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the on the show with us today. Um, I am sure we'll have you back again. Um, so uh, we're we're looking for repeat guests as well. So um, yeah, thank you so much for for talking to us today. My pleasure. Thank you all. All, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and transition back uh, to uh, back by who? We're gonna go ahead and transition back over. And uh, we'll go ahead and start talking about a, a new person uh, that's going to be joining us and, and we're going to be talking about. Um, so we have another animal here. So Cabbage, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. So we sure do. We keep a lot of different animals here at camp. I'm going to grab one of my friends and bring him up on the table right now. The suspense. The suspense. <gasps> Danger Noodle! So this is Herman. Um, on the internet, people do like to meme snakes as danger noodles, but Herman is just the gentlest guy you will ever meet. Um, he is really awesome um, all throughout the summer and our after education trips. Um, he will come out and he'll let us hold him and he'll let kids pet him and come up and meet him and see how he's doing. Um, and as long as you're treating him with respect, he's going to be pretty gentle and calm with you. You'll see he'll crawl all over me. Um, if it's a chilly day, he actually does like to crawl inside of your uh, sweatshirt pocket, which I found out one day, which was pretty funny. The kids really enjoyed it as I was holding him, talking about him, and he crawled right inside my sweatshirt pocket. Uh, but a couple of things about Herman. Herman is obviously a corn snake. Um, so looking at him and seeing that he is this bright, beautiful orange and a little darker orange and then some black banding, uh, you might think, oh, corn snake, I wonder what he eats. Anybody at home know what he eats? Uh, I can tell you right now, it's not corn. Kids a lot of times will guess that it is corn, but uh, the reason he's called a corn snake um, is you can see his coloring. 
Um, it's this nice um, dark colors which help him to blend in in the places that he likes to live. Um, and places that he would live out in the wild would be places like cornfields or uh, barns, um, anywhere that they can find rodents and is nice and dry. Um, they like to go through um, rodents burrows and that's what they're searching for because they eat things like mice. Um, so Herman is a carnivore. He is a meat only eater. Um, and right now he is really interested in coming over and checking me out. And he's kind of wrapped himself around our camera as well. So since he's a carnivore uh, cabbage, what, what kind of stuff do we feed him here at camp? Um, that's actually pretty interesting. The kids have been helping me with it the last couple of weeks. So we feed Herman mice, uh, but we don't feed him live mice because with uh, pet snakes, um, you don't want them to have too much of that predatory sense going on. Um, so if you were to feed them live mice, they learn that they need to attack things that move. Um, whereas we feed him um, mice that have been humanely killed and shipped to us. Um, that are um, grown specifically for snake food um, and we get them in a big frozen bag and then we will individually thaw them and warm them up for him when it's time for him to eat and we'll actually put him into a little separate container from his normal home and that's just where he eats so he knows that when he goes into that box it's dinner time. So um, you, you mentioned that he's a, he's a non-venomous snake. Um, are there any tips that you, you know of that you can kind of use to identify a, a venomous snake or a non-venomous snake? There are. Um, and the first one that I like to go with um, is if you don't know it's a venomous snake, just assume always that it's a venomous snake. Um, but if you do know, like I personally know that Herman is not venomous, one of the ways you can tell is by the shape of their head. Um, if I can get him to cooperate with me, uh, which doesn't look like he wants to do, but his head is very narrow. Um, and venomous snakes will often have a very triangular shaped head um, that's much wider um, at the base, which is allowing for them to have those venom glands in their head. Um, whereas Herman here, you can see his head is just barely wider than the rest of his body. Um, and I was talking earlier a little bit about uh, his coloration. Um, if I kind of give him a tilt here, you can see his underside. Um, and his underside has this nice, pretty white and black banding. Um, and this is thought to be one of the reasons that they were named corn snakes, other than liking to hang out in cornfields, is their bellies look a little bit like uh, Native American corn or that mixed corn that you uh, see sometimes at the grocery store. Um, so that's one of the places that his name is rumored to have come from. Very interesting. So um, how, how long can they grow? Uh, so corn snakes specifically can grow up to about six feet uh, or 72 inches. And if Herman will cooperate, I'll see if I can stretch him out just as far as I can, just being nice and gentle with him. And you can see Herman is about four feet wide. So he's not quite fully grown, um, but he's a, a mature snake and he's getting on up there in his, uh, his age and size. So um, I've always, I always noticed that when people keep snakes, they, they have like heat lamps and stuff. Why, why, do they, why do you do that with, that with snakes and other reptiles? Yeah, so just like with reptar, um, Herman is cold-blooded. And what cold-blooded means is basically they can't metabolize their food in order to create heat. Um, so they have to get the heat that they need to live from the surrounding environment. Um, so in the wild, he would do that by laying out in a nice sunny spot maybe on a nice dark rock um, so that he can get nice and warm because when he's nice and warmed up, he can move really fast and catch up to those mice and um, whatever he happens to be hunting that day, the small rodents. Um, and then in the winter time, they actually go into hibernation because there's not enough warmth for them to come out. So they'll stay burrowed down in the ground um, deep enough where it stays a pretty constant temperature, which is right around 55 degrees um, down in their burrows. So, um, do snakes have live birth or do they lay eggs? Can we talk a little more about kind of how baby snakes? We definitely eat? can. Um, so, baby snakes definitely requires two snakes starting off, uh, you know, a male and a female to mate. Um, and then the females will lay um, between 10 to 30 eggs. Um, and when a female snake lays those eggs, once she lays the eggs, that's it. She will leave those eggs alone. Um, they will um, mature on their own and hatch out. When a baby corn snake hatches up, they're about this long. They're about 10 inches long, um, up to about 15 inches. 
Um, and as soon as they are born, they don't get any help from their mother. Snakes don't have milk or anything like that. Um, they just are on their own to go and find food and um, carry on being, being a snake. They just get to it right as they come out. Um, Herman's giving a really good example right now. You can see he's kind of giving my arm a hug. Um, and as he does that, it's allowing him to hold on to me. Um, and this is actually how corn snakes hunt. Um, so just like I was saying, they do hunt um, little rodents. Um, and they don't have venom, so when they bite a rodent, their teeth are pretty small, so the teeth biting them is really not going to do that much damage to the rodent, but they still need to be able to kill their rodent so that they can eat and continue on. Um, and corn snakes are part of a group of snakes called constrictors. Um, so what they do is they will actually wrap their body around um, whatever their prey item is, and then they will squeeze it. Um, and it's you know part of the circle of life because uh, in order for them to live they have to eat something else and the way um, that they do that is they squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and they squeeze so tight um, that the animal um, goes unconscious from not being able to breathe and then passes on and then they can eat it um, and you'll notice his head is very very tiny but his body's pretty big and the things that he eats are pretty big um, so when he is ready to eat something he can actually unhinge his jaw and open his mouth really, really wide, as wide as his body is down here in the center, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so, you know, there people have, what I hear is a lot of the times people kill snakes when they encounter them in their backyard. Um, a lot of the times people even here at camp um, say, oh, you need to kill the, come and kill this snake. Um, but we, we really have a very strong policy that that's not something that we do. So um, why, why are snakes so beneficial and so helpful for, for our ecosystems? So there's a lot of different reasons that they're beneficial, but I'm going to come at it from, uh, just because we were talking to who, I'm going to come at it from a, um, an agricultural standpoint. So these are called corn snakes, and they eat, um, you know, little rodents and things. Um, and that leads me to ask, what do little rodents eat? So little rodents like to eat grains and corns, things like that, that we're growing um, either for our consumption or for other animals' consumption. Um, and the corn snakes keep those animals in check. So they keep the population of mice down to where it's a... Uh, sustainable loss of food for the farmers and the farmers aren't losing entire crops of food um, because those rodents are just going ham all over their stuff. Very nice. Well, it was really great to, to, to meet Herman today. Um, is there anything that we missed that you wanted to, to, to talk about and cover? I think the last thing, if I can just get him to cooperate and stick his head over near here, um, you'll notice that uh, he flicks his tongue out and swishes it through the air. Um, so snakes do have nostrils, but they also have an incredibly sensitive um, sense of taste and or smell, depending on how you're looking at it. And their forked tongue, as it passes through the air, will touch all those air particles. Um, and as they're doing that, they're actually tasting the air or smelling the air, um, looking for um, just, you know, indicators on where food is or where um, water is and just what's going on around them. Very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Herman. Uh, it was good to see you again, my friend. And uh, we'll be sure to have some more animal friends uh, for you guys to meet in, uh, uh, later on this week, possibly, uh, and, and into the next couple of weeks. So um, we hope you guys enjoyed that aspect of our show. Say goodbye, Herman. Bye, Herman. All right. Um, so for our, our last bit, um, we wanted to give some, some stuff that you guys can actually try uh, at, at home um, and, and uh, kind of a cool craft or cool party trick um, that you guys can take away. Um, so as you guys can see, uh, I, I uh, told Cabbage to bring a dollar bill today, uh, which I brought my dollar bill. Cabbage, um, do you want to show them what kind of dollar bill you brought today? I'd love to. So you said that we were trying to make something fancy. So here's so my dollar. I figured that I would go with something fancy for my uh, dollar bill. Oh, I went too far. But yeah. So, Cabbage is making the big bucks. So <laughs> I am going to make a one dollar bow tie uh, and Cabbage is going to go ahead and make, I guess, a hundred dollar bow tie. Um, so let's, uh, let's make sure I've got this on the camera so you guys can see it. Um, so uh, if, it, if you need to go grab a uh, dollar bill, um, feel free to go grab that um, and we'll go ahead and, and get started. So I find that the dollar bill works best for this trick. Um, the unfortunate part is, is that we um, have changed, or that the, the United States has changed uh, the position of the head uh, on the new dollar bills. As you guys can see, um, the, the head is slightly further to the left. Um, so it's not quite as centered and so this trick doesn't work as well anymore and that's why I think the dollar bill is best for it. 
So hopefully uh, while I was explaining that, you guys were able to go get your dollar bill. So the first step um, with this, kind of like origami, we're gonna be doing um, a, a lot of different creases um, that are really more to, to provide kind of a, a placeholder or a line for us uh, to be able to, to know where, we're, where our next fold is gonna be. So this very first is gonna be a, uh, one of those creases. So you're gonna take it and you're gonna fold it um, and you're gonna wanna make sure that uh, George Washington's head is on the outside of, of that fold. So um, go ahead and make a nice crease. And it's always good to kind of take a, take a, I always take like my nail and kind of run my finger down there. So that crease, uh, I don't know if you guys, how well you guys can see it so that, but so that crease is uh, really, really obvious in that dollar bill. The next step that we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna take it and we're gonna fold it into quarters and we're gonna bring each side basically to the middle where you made that initial crease. So that crease is kind of serving as your mark. So um, you can see I did that first fold, just like that. And I'm gonna take this second fold and fold it again, just like that. So now, uh, if you look at the dollar bill, um, it should look something like this. And then on the back, it's got both of the uh, top and bottom of the bill uh, folded to meet right in the center. The, the next step is you're gonna take it and you're just very simply going to fold it in half again. Um, this seam needs to go on the inside of your fold, so make sure you do that as well. So now we're gonna fold that in half again, just like that, to make sure again that you've got nice, good creases. So this is the part, um, honestly, this is the part that can be a little tricky uh, and takes a little bit of practice sometimes to get used to it. So um, for this, this is going to be a crease, which is gonna make our next fold much easier. So what you're gonna do is we're gonna make a, almost like a little house uh, right where George Washington's head is. So you're gonna fold the corners down and you want it to be relatively even See, so I've got my corners folded down. Do you guys see how it kind of looks almost like a little house uh, from the other side? And uh, then you can actually unfold those. Now what you're gonna do is wherever you folded, where the, the, on the lines that you folded before, you're gonna take that fold and you're gonna, you're gonna take it and you're basically gonna pop it in. So you're gonna invert the corners. So you'll still, it'll still end up looking like a house, but you're gonna use the crease marks that you had before to make kind of a little inversion and it'll end up looking like that. So that's how the fold will end up looking. I'm gonna look at the comments really quick and make sure that we're, all right, there we go. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at now. So now you've got your little house, um, you're, you're, almost, you're almost there. So the next step is go ahead and lay, it, lay this flat down on the table again. Doesn't matter which side is up or down but you're gonna take it and you're gonna fold it all the way to the bottom of kind of where that little triangle is. Don't fold over the triangle, just to the bottom of it. So you can kind of see right there what that looks like. And then the next one, you're gonna do the exact same thing on the other side. Fold it just like so and you should have like a little rectangle at this point. All right, we are on our second to last step. So we're gonna take again and we're gonna do a little house fold. But on this one, um, you'll notice that at this point you should have it, it should kinda look like this on the inside. So you're gonna take one side of it and you're going to fold it. And make a little house. And then you're gonna just flip it over and do the exact same thing to the other side. So, and it's okay if yours looks a little different or a little sloppier. Um, it, it, it takes a while to really get used to it. So this is the part where we're gonna have our big unveil. Um, so what I like to do is I always like to kind of take my fingers and put them um, on top of all those folds right there so that it doesn't unfold as we try to pull this out. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna take it, just pull it out like that, 
you may have to flatten George's face down just a little bit, and wha-bam, you have yourself a fancy $1 bill bow tie, uh, and you've got George Washington's face uh, right there, right in the center. Um, unfortunately, like I said earlier, um, we, uh, we don't get the face on the new bill. Um, if you really want to get fancy, you can also uh, fold the corners of your bow tie, like so. If you're feeling stylish, and that way your bow tie has some has some corners on it, or some uh, some some kind of triangles on the end. Uh, but that is one of my favorite ways uh, to give people uh, dollar bills. Um, I always used to get these uh, for my birthday when I was a kid, uh, just like this. Uh, and it's just one of those uh, things that I've committed to memory and have done my whole life. So uh, that is how you fold a, a one dollar bill. Um, there's all sorts of really cool other tricks you can do. There's one where you can make a frog. There's one where you can do a, make a peacock. Um, so I would encourage you guys, if you haven't, um, we, can, uh, we can post some links up. Um, that uh, also have some, some other resources for how to fold dollar bills, but uh, just a cool little project you can do at home uh, if you have a dollar or, or a dollar bill. So That was pretty cool, Hoopla, and I, I like how George's face is in the center of yours, but I, I also am a big fan of blue, as you can probably tell by my watch, so I, I like this blue stripe right down the middle of mine. Very nice. And, I mean, my blue stripe also has a, a wicked mullet going on. So it that's does. Pretty cool. <laughs> Well, that brings us uh, to the end of our episode today. Uh, we really hope um, that you guys are enjoying the content that we're, uh, we're putting out so far. Um, again, if you have any feedback, would like to be a guest on the show, um, or uh, just want to give us a shout out, please like and share and comment and uh, help us reach a wider audience. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. We will have a, uh, you guys have a great rest of your day, and we will see you tomorrow at 2.30. See you all.